We'll discover who the Spirit is, how the Spirit functions. Every revival in the history of Christianity has taken place because of the mighty, powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, filled with love, has willed your salvation. Jesus came, dwelt in human flesh. Jesus came and met the devil head on. If you knew Jesus was going to be personally here, wouldn't you want to sit at his feet? He sends the Holy Spirit to come along our side as the helper, to strengthen us. During this series, we are going to be probing the depths of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We'll discover who the Spirit is, how the Spirit functions, what the work of the Spirit is. We'll discuss such topics as revival and the Holy Spirit, prayer and the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about praying for the ministry of the Spirit and opening our hearts to receive that power, that life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. We'll discuss the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, we need to discuss true and false manifestations of the Holy Spirit because not everything attributed to the Holy Spirit is, in fact, the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll look at the latter rain, the outpouring of the Spirit at end time to finish God's work on earth. Stay with us through this entire series on Three Angels Broadcasting. This will be a series that not only helps us to understand more clearly the ministry of the Spirit, but it'll be a series that enables us to be changed deep within as the Spirit speaks to our hearts. I'll be praying that God will open our hearts to receive the fullness of the Spirit during this series. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity once again to open your word. Thank you that the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible will inspire us as we study together. May the life-changing power of the Spirit come. May the great Comforter who Christ promised come. May the third person of the Godhead come and change our lives as we study together. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of opening your word. May it speak with power to our hearts. In Christ's name, amen. The title of this first presentation is The Holy Spirit and revival. Every revival in the history of Christianity has taken place because of the mighty, powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. But that leads us to a very important question. Some time ago, I was lecturing on the Holy Spirit, and a man came to me and he said, uh, I have a question for you, Pastor. Yes. What is it? And he, very, he was very kind, very humble, but he began to kind of beat all around the bush, as we could say. You know, he, he just was wandering. He quoted a Bible text here and a Bible text there. And I, I said, sir, kid, do you have a question? He said, yeah, I do. I said, what's your question? And here was his question. Is the Holy Spirit a power flowing from God as some sort of impersonal influence, or is the Holy Spirit a divine person? Now, there's a lot of discussion about that today. Who is the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit this power that emanates from God? Is the Holy Spirit an influence? Is the Holy Spirit some kind of impersonal force? Or is the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead? One thing is for certain. What you believe about the Holy Spirit is going to make a dramatic difference. If the Holy Spirit is merely a force that makes all the difference in your life and how you relate to the Holy Spirit. But if the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, that makes a big difference too. You say, how does it make a difference? If the Holy Spirit is a mere influence or power, we might try to grasp this power. We might try to use this power. So if the Holy Spirit is simply a power, then we are in control or charge trying to use that power for our own ends. But if the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, then we fall in submission to Christ. We fall in submission to the one who sent the Spirit to testify of Jesus. 
throughout those four great chapters on the Holy Spirit in the book of John, where Jesus introduces us to the subject of the Holy Spirit, John 14, 15, and 16. In those chapters, the Holy Spirit is mentioned as he or him 24 different times, which is really quite significant. In the book, Gospel Workers, written over 125 years ago in 1892, the author makes this remarkable statement. The book is written to pastors, to Bible instructors, to other lay leaders who are sharing the gospel. And here's the statement. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of our needs. We must have the holy unction from God, the baptism of his spirit for this, the only efficient agent in the proclamation of sacred truth. It is the spirit of God that quickens the lifeless faculties of the soul to appreciate heavenly things and attracts the affections toward God and his truth. This is a remarkable and amazing statement actually. Notice it says that it's the Holy Spirit that quickens or makes alive the lifeless faculties of the soul. Unless we have that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, our spiritual life becomes dull and our spiritual faculties are deadened. The other thing about the statement that's very interesting is it says that we are attracted to heavenly things by the Holy Spirit. So we can go through the motions of Christianity. We can go through all those perfunctory duties, praying, studying the Bible, but unless the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, unless God's Holy Spirit changes us and transforms us and creates within us the life of God, unless the Holy Spirit is resident within us, the faculties of the soul will become spiritually dead. Yet many people fail to understand the truth that the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. Dr. Bill Bright, founder, former president of Campus Crusade for Christ, had his organization take a survey of people about their knowledge of the Holy Spirit. And they concluded nearly 95% of the respondents have indicated that they have little knowledge of who the Holy Spirit is or why he exists. Now these were Christians and it's quite amazing that 95% of all the Christians surveyed had little idea of who the Holy Spirit was, little idea of why he existed. A.W. Tozer, famous revivalist of past century said this, the idea of the spirit held by the average church member is so vague as to be nearly non-existent. So if that is true, and surveys bear out the fact that it is, then, and if it is true that it's the Holy Spirit that reawakens the lifeless faculties of the soul, if it's true that the Holy Spirit draws us out to understand heavenly things, if it is the Holy Spirit that changes us and transforms us from within, yet there is this lack of fundamental knowledge about the Holy Spirit, this lack of basic understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how he works. Bill Bright goes on to say this in his book, Purpose and Power, page 34, I am personally convinced that if today's Christians better understood the Bible's basic teachings about the Holy Spirit and then invited him to release his power in their lives each day, they, he says, would experience unprecedented joy and personal fulfillment. More than that, our verbal and nonverbal witness for Jesus would sweep the world. Would you like to experience in your life deeper joy? Would you like to experience greater purpose in your life? Would you like to experience in your life greater peace, greater sense of fulfillment, a greater sense of power? Understanding the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the answer to that question. Would you like to experience unprecedented intimacy with God, a closeness to God like you have never experienced before. This sense of God's presence, this sense that you know God, this sense that your prayers were going higher than the ceiling, but that you're really connecting with God. What is the vital link that links earth with heaven? It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I repeat, 
Would you like to experience unprecedented intimacy with God? I know that's the desire of your heart. It certainly is the desire of, of, of my heart. Would you like to receive Christ's supernatural power to live a victorious Christian life? Did you notice that some people struggle again and again with victory in their own life? They struggle over things like anger and bitterness and gossip. They struggle over things like lust, impatience, unkindness, ingratitude. They struggle again and again. It's like they're chained. It's like they're bound to these sins. It's the Holy Spirit entering into our lives that gives us the power for victory and the power to overcome. Would you like to be a powerful witness for Jesus in the world? Why is it? that at times we may give out a piece of literature, give out a book, pray with somebody, study the Bible with somebody, and it seems to have very little impact in their life. Could it be, could it be, because our own lives are not filled with the third person of the Godhead and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit personally? Understanding who the Holy Spirit is and receiving him into your life is the key to a fulfilled Christian life. If we want fulfillment in the Christian life, if we want deep purpose in the Christian life, if we want power in our Christian lives, if we long for something more, possibly you've come to a plateau in your Christian life. Possibly you've come to a point where you felt, I've been stuck here. Could it be? that what you're really longing for is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the power of the third person of the Godhead in your life. The first thing to understand in the reception of the Holy Spirit is the question of who is the Holy Spirit? Back to the question that this gentleman asked me after one of my lectures, is the Holy Spirit a force? Is the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead? Who indeed is the Holy Spirit? Now, we often equate divine personality with visibility. Let me explain what I mean by that. What do we mean by we equate divine personality with visibility? When you think of God, at least you're thinking of God the Father, and you can kind of have some kind of picture of that as a human being. Uh, a divine being, of course, but as human beings, we can picture somewhat in our mind this divine being. What about Jesus? Well, Jesus dwelt in human flesh. We can kind of picture Christ here. We've seen artists' drawings of him, although those artists' drawings, of course, are not 100% accurate, but well, we've seen that. So you can picture, kind of picture God the Father. You can kind of picture God the Son, Jesus. Very difficult to picture the Holy Spirit because how do you picture something that is omnipresent. How, how, how do you picture something that seems to be present everywhere? How do you picture something that is difficult to picture? So we equate divine personality with visibility, and we think if something is visible, then it must have divine personality. If it's not visible, maybe, maybe it doesn't. How then do we understand the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead? Now, thinking of the Holy Spirit as a force rather than a divine being is a human attempt to explain divine reality. In other words, the vastness of God, the greatness of God, the infinite wisdom of God. And we, we can't put God in a box. We can't try to define often uh, heavenly things with the weakness of our human mind. One theologian said, to try to understand the Trinity is to lose one's mind. To deny the Trinity is to lose one's soul. In other words, this idea of three separate, co-equal, co-eternal beings in the Godhead. Now, the Bible doesn't use the term Trinity. Um, I tend to, would rather to use the word Godhead. What do we mean by Godhead? We mean that the Bible teaches there are three separate, distinct beings in the Godhead. They're distinct beings. They're not three beings merged into one. We see that outlined in Scripture. Now, you don't have to understand 
everything about something to appreciate the something we may not know everything about. So we're going to go into this subject quite deeply. and We may never fully understand it, but you don't have to understand everything about something to appreciate the something that you don't understand everything about. Let me give you an example. There's electricity here in the studio. We have lights that are shining on me to make the picture a little more clearly. We can see more clearly the picture. Now, if you asked me, what is the mathematical formula for electricity? I, I couldn't tell you that. If you asked me, though, um, how does electricity function so that this power produces light and produces the rays? I may not understand that. If I told you that there were pictures floating around in this room, and if I had a little box with a glass on it and some knobs or a little remote, I could get those pictures. How, how do you explain a television wave? How do you explain radio, radio waves that go through the sky? Look, because I don't understand everything about electricity doesn't mean that I'm never going to flip a light switch. Because I don't understand everything about how television waves work doesn't mean I'm not going to push a remote or take digestion, for example. Can you explain to me how you eat that healthy granola and uh, as you eat that you chew it all up and you swallow it and uh, there are vitamins in that uh, you get the b complex vitamins there's fiber there there's a little protein from the nuts in it how, can you explain exactly how digestion works how how you chew it in the mouth and the saliva glands uh, help in the digestive process it starts in your mouth and you swallow it, uh, the food and and your stomach begins to process it all and it's absorbed into the bloodstream and these vitamins help to stabilize the nervous system and produce the muscle and are healthy to the organs. Can you explain all that to me from a scientific standpoint? Now, maybe if you're a nutritionist, you can, but most people can't. But because we can't understand it, does that mean that we're going to stop eating? <laughs> not at all. We continue to eat, although we may not understand every vitamin, mineral, protein, every carbohydrate in the food that we're eating, right? And it's the same thing with divine things. We may not understand it fully, but here's an important point. Be when something is infinite, you will never understand everything about it, but that doesn't mean you can't understand anything about it. If something is infinite, the more you study it, the more beautiful it becomes. The more it becomes like a multifaceted diamond that you hold in your hands and you turn it, and as the sunlight reflects off that diamond, you see it more beautifully. And that's exactly what it's like when you study the Holy Spirit. The more you study the Holy Spirit, the more you understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, although it's infinite like an ocean before you, the more it becomes beautiful to you, the more power from the Spirit comes into your life because the more I understand, the more I can appropriate the Holy Spirit's power. Now, thinking of the Holy Spirit as a force rather than a divine being is a human attempt to explain divine reality. And that's not possible because it's infinite. But it's also contrary to the Bible. You say, what's contrary to the Bible? The idea that the Holy Spirit is a force rather than a divine being. The fact that some will say, well, the Holy Spirit's only an influence. Uh, the Bible does not teach that. Let's look at three extremely plain New Testament passages that describe the divine trio in the Godhead. Let's look at them. The first, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of, now don't miss this, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now notice in this passage, you don't have one greater God and two lesser gods. There's no difference. You've got the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, three separate, distinct divine beings. When you look, for example, at Ephesians 2, verse 18, very similar, through him, that's through Christ. We have access, how? By one Spirit under the Father. So here, in one Bible passage, you have Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. Three separate, distinct beings, but each one of these beings has their own function. So they're not the same in function. Neither are they the same in person. Three distinct, separate beings with different functions. In Scripture, 
you have the father who often wills, the son who works and the spirit who witnesses. There's a fascinating passage in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 9 through 15. So let me share it with you. Hebrews 10 verse 9 to 15. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Now this is Jesus speaking. So God has a will. Jesus comes to do the Father's will. Then it says, verse 10, by what that will we have been sanctified. That's by the will of God we've been sanctified. So God wills. Then we look further down in the passage and we notice that there's something else that's taking place. But this man, that is Christ, that after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So here in the passage, you have the Father who wills our salvation. You have Christ who tabernacles in human flesh. Christ who dwells in human flesh. Christ who comes to live the life we should have lived and die the death we should have died. The Son who comes and works out our salvation. Then, as you let your eyes drop down in the passage, it tells us about the fact that the Holy Spirit witnesses to all of this. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. The Holy Spirit witnesses to us. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit play a part together in our salvation. That's Paul's point in Hebrews chapter 10. It's the Father who wills our salvation. The incredible good news is that the Father in heaven, filled with love, has willed your salvation before you were ever born. He had a divinely predestined plan for you to be saved. He predesigned a plan for you to be saved. He willed your salvation. Now your choice can determine whether you will accept his plan or not. And because he's a predesigned plan, doesn't mean you are locked into that plan and automatically will be saved. Not at all. What it does mean is that he willed your salvation. But who worked out your salvation? Jesus. Jesus came, dwelt in human flesh. Jesus came and met the devil head on. Jesus came and faced the Satan's temptations. Jesus worked out the plan of the Father. But how do we have access to that plan? Who witnesses of that plan? It's the Holy Spirit living in our lives that witness of that plan of salvation. Throughout Scripture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit cooperate to accomplish heaven's purposes in the plan of redemption. They work together, separate, distinct beings, but all working for our salvation. Let's go back and notice some of the milestones there in creation and Old Testament history and redemption. If you go back to creation, for example, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, it says that Christ created the heavens and the earth. It says that Christ created all things. But then in Genesis 1, it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. How do you explain that? Again, the Father wills creation. He is the divine strategist who plans it. Christ carries out those plans, but how? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, or think about, for example, Jesus' baptism. Christ is being baptized. As Christ is being baptized, what happens? The Father speaks from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So you have Jesus going into the water, the Father speaking from heaven, and then a dove, the Holy Spirit, comes down upon Jesus. And so you have the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Christ's baptism. What about Christ's death and resurrection? Who raised Jesus from the dead? Who raised Jesus? Did, did, did the Father raise Jesus from the dead? Did Jesus raise himself from the dead? Uh, did the Holy Spirit raise him? Yes, yes, and yes. In other words, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all participated in Christ's resurrection. Jesus said, if I lay down my life, I'll take it up again. Then, if you look, though, it says that the Father's power raised him from the dead in the New Testament. Romans 8 says the Holy Spirit raised him. Any contradictions? Not at all. Father, Son, Holy Spirit 
participate in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So throughout the Bible, you have this concept of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working together to accomplish the purposes of humanity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, one text, you have these three mentioned again. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now notice you got it, three of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. So God's love provides grace and we receive that grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. So all through scripture, you have this idea of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working for our salvation. Isn't that incredibly good news? Heaven has provided everything possible for you to be saved. Heaven has provided the richness of the heavenly gifts to save you and to save me. Heaven has provided grace. That grace flows from the heart of a God that loves us beyond what we'll ever know, that he wills us to be saved. But that grace is received through Christ as the Holy Spirit applies that grace to our hearts as we come to Jesus and recognize the Father's love, recognize the Father's desire for us to be saved as we come on our knees seeking God because of the love that has been manifest to us by the Father through Christ. The Holy Spirit impresses us. The Holy Spirit impresses us with the attitudes in our hearts, in our lives that separate us from God. There may be bitterness within. There may be resentment within. There may be anger towards somebody else within. There may be self-centeredness and, and egotism and pride within. As we're on our knees praying, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us those things in our lives that are not in harmony with God's will. But not only does the Holy Spirit impress us with those things, the Holy Spirit grants to us the power to overcome. So it's the Holy Spirit that the third person of the Godhead, not some impersonal force, not some unusual power, but it is rather the power of, the, of God through the Holy Spirit that enters our life. You know, when you look at the Holy Spirit in Scripture, the Holy Spirit has the attrib attributes of personality. For example, Genesis 6, when it's talking about the flood, it says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. A force can't strive with you. Uh, Romans chapter 8 says, the Holy Spirit witnesses or pleads for us. The Holy Spirit presents us before God's throne, our prayers with groanings that cannot be uttered. Strives, pleads, witnesses, groanings. Um, Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve a force. You can only grieve something that has to have divine personality. Um, it's through the Holy Spirit that we enter into, into intimate communion with the divine. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals to us who Jesus is, who reveals to us the love of God. It's the Holy Spirit that we enter in in our prayer lives with this intimate relationship with God. In John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen what? The Father. So when Christ came, he was the representative of the Father. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, the Father is on center stage in the Old Testament. We see Jesus veiled in the Old Testament, veiled in the sacrifices, veiled in the various feasts that the Old Testament Israelites performed. So in the Old Testament, God is on center stage, the Father. In the New Testament, Jesus is on center stage. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus, center stage. 
He comes, touches the eyes of the blind and they're open, touches the ears of the deaf and they're unstopped, touches the withered man's arm and it's healed, touches the lame's legs and they jump and walk again. He delivers demoniacs, forgives a woman caught in adultery. So Jesus is on center stage in the New Testament. Paul speaks about him. Every New Testament writer is saturated with Jesus, 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 and the grace of God. When Christ ascends to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit. And the dispensation that we are living in right now is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. It's the time that God longs to pour out his spirit in abundance upon his people. The Holy Spirit is just as real, just as much a divine person, just as much a member of the Godhead as the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit, according to Scripture, is a divine person, not some force, not something that simply proceeds from the Father. Leroy Froom, in his book, The Coming of the Comforter, Froom is a great biblical scholar, on page 41 writes, Jesus was the most marked and influential personality ever in this old world. And the Holy Spirit was to supply his vacated place. Now notice this sentence, it's, it's critical. No one but a person could take the place of this wondrous person. No mere influence would ever suffice. So the Holy Spirit, if he is going to come in Christ's stead, must indeed take the place of Jesus, so therefore has to be a divine personality. In the book Evangelism, Ellen White on page 615 confirms the biblical truth that the Holy Spirit is a divine person or divine personality. There are three, no, no, don't miss this, living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Notice what it says. There are three living persons in the heavenly trio. Have you ever heard a, a, a ladies' trio sing sing so beautifully. They're singing the same song, but each one of the trio has a different uh, voice uh, inflection. Each one of the trio, they might be an alto, maybe a soprano. Each part of that trio has a different song part to sing. And so the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three, what does it say there? Three living persons in the Godhead. And uh, each one has a different role to play. We also find this in a book, Testimonies to Ministers, page 392. Ellen White is writing to ministers here, and she again confirms what the Bible says. She wanted to be sure that ministers had this straight, that workers for God had this straight. It was so critical. Evil had been accumulating for centuries. That's up to the first century when Christ came and could only be restrained by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. So when Christ left this world, when he left to ascend to heaven, he promised that the Holy Spirit would come, and the Holy Spirit would come with no modified energy. When something is modified, it's reduced. It's not with full force. But he would come with the unlimited power of heaven. What incredible good news. Christ sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes with fullness of power to change our lives, to transform our lives, if we understand who the Holy Spirit is, the third person of the Godhead, and get on our knees and claim and plead for the Holy Spirit. You remember what it says in the book of Luke, chapter 11. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? The Holy Spirit comes as we're on our knees praying and seeking God for this power to come and to change our very lives. Now, Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit is life transforming. Let's go to Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit. 
What did Christ teach about the Holy Spirit? And why is what Christ taught about the Holy Spirit so life transforming? John 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would not be some external force, but the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead would come and live within us as believers, dwell within us as believers. You say, Pastor Mark, I don't understand that. And the skeptic would say, impossible. The cynic would say, what are you, crazy? But that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus teaches. And Jesus cannot lie. It's impossible, Scripture says, for him to lie. So he, he tells us that the third person of the Godhead would come and live with us and that bubbling up within us would be this power of the living Christ so we could sh reflect his love, reflect his goodness, his kindness. So Christianity is not clenching your fists. It's not uh, simply gritting your teeth and bearing it and saying, I'm going to be a Christian if it kills me. It's rather opening your heart to the loving Christ and allowing his spirit to come into you to crush out the evil forces that try to dominate our lives. We live in a world where seeing is believing and people say, well, if I can't see it, I don't think I believe it. But God's word tells us that by faith, we can grasp the reality of the fact that the Holy Spirit is indeed the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit indeed wants to live within us. The Holy Spirit indeed wants to transform our lives. And he's waiting for our permission to come and to transform us. If you cannot touch it, somebody says, if it's not material, if you can't quantify it, the idea is it does not exist. But this, of course, is a secular way, a humanistic way, a postmodern way of dealing with divine things. We come not simply looking at things from a strictly rational standpoint. We come humbly. We come in faith. We come accepting what the word of God says, where Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and he is going to live and dwell within your life as a believer. He's going to journey with you through the dark valleys of life. He's going to journey with you over the mountains that you must climb. He's going to journey with you walking by your side. The first and second person of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and take residence in our hearts through the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So how is it? that God dwells in us? How is it that Christ dwells in you? It is through the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Jesus, when he was going back to heaven, did not leave us orphans. We're not orphans sitting by the wayside, begging for food from spiritual food from the Heavenly Father. He didn't go back to heaven and abandon us. He didn't leave us alone in this world to struggle. You know, one of the most tragic things is when a child is left alone as an orphan. They're left by the side of the road. Their parents maybe can't afford to support them any longer. Parents can't afford to feed them. So they just leave them there. There have been instances where babies have been wrapped in blankets and left in a little basket on the doorsteps of a hospital with a note saying, please find somebody to take care of my child. But that's not the way it is in Christianity. Christ did not ascend to heaven and then leave us alone. What did he say in John 14, verse 18? I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Christ promised that he would come to his disciples. And how was he to come? How was he to return to them? Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For example, Jesus fills us with his personal presence 
through the Holy Spirit. That's how we experience the presence of Christ. In the book Steps to Christ, a book that has been circulated with hundreds of millions of copies, one of the best sellers ever in Christianity, page 74 and 75, it says this, Pentecost brought them the presence of the Comforter, of whom Christ had said, he shall be in you. And he had further said, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. Henceforth, through the Spirit, Christ was to abide continually in the hearts of his children. Their union with him was closer than when he was personally with them. Does this kind of amaze you? Does this kind of overwhelm you? Jesus said to his disciples, it's expedient. What's another word for expedient? Necessary. It's necessary that I go away. And if, because if I don't go away, the comforter is not going to come. And I can imagine Peter, James, and John, I can imagine this disciple saying, Jesus, please don't do it. Jesus, please don't go away. What do you mean it's expedient that you go away? Jesus, no, don't go. And then this uh, remarkable statement in the book Steps to Christ that says that we can have closer union with Jesus now, today, through the Holy Spirit than we could if he were personally here. Wow. If you knew Jesus was going to be personally here, wouldn't you want to sit at his feet? Wouldn't you want to listen to what he had to say? How could it be that we can be closer to Jesus today through the ministry of the Holy Spirit than if he were personally here? I think the reason that is true is, is there's a couple of reasons it's true. One, if Jesus were here and he were in one physical place, he couldn't be in another place. He would have the limitation of his physical body. But now every believer in the world, because of the omnipresent of the, of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit can be present everywhere, can experience this closeness to Jesus. You say, Pastor, I don't understand that. Don't worry about it. Nobody else does either. There's a lot of things we may not understand, but we can accept, as we mentioned earlier, by faith. There's another reason. Jesus can speak to us, but the Holy Spirit can live within us. And Christ lives within us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, it's expedient, necessary that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. And you're going to experience closer relationship with me because the Holy Spirit's going to live within you. He's going to dwell within you and give you strength and power. He's going to, his love is going to flow out through you. His kindness is going to throw out through you. His goodness is going to flow out through you. In the Review and Herald, November 29, 1892, the Review and Herald was a, a Christian magazine, review meaning Advent review, and it, uh, and, uh, Rather, the Sabbath Review was reviewing the Sabbath truth and Herald, the Advent Herald. In November 29, 1892, this Christian magazine, the author Ellen White said, The work of the Holy Spirit is immeasurably great. How great is it, everybody? How great? Immeasurably great. It is from this source that the power and efficiency come to the worker of God. And the Holy Spirit is the comforter as the personal presence of Christ to the soul. So the Holy Spirit is this personal presence of Christ to our soul. The Holy Spirit comes into our life and, and resides there. Now, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do when it comes into the life of the believer? We've already alluded to it a little bit, but let's even probe it more deeply. What does the Holy Spirit do? What does this precious heavenly gift desire to do for each follower of Christ? As we open our hearts to receive the Holy Spirit, what can we expect the Spirit to do in our lives? What is Jesus longing to do through the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life? Now, the Holy Spirit is our personal helper, our personal helper as we face temptation our personal helper as we struggle with sin, our personal helper as we climb the steep mountains of life, as we journey from earth to heaven. In fact, John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Now you see this word helper here is a very fascinating word. Jesus continues, for if I do not go away, the helper, notice this word helper, will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Incidentally, a helper has to be more than a force. A force is not much of a helper. It may be a power, but it's not much of a helper. Um, 
but helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send what? Him, again, third person pronoun, uh, personality, divine personality. See this word helper in the Greek word language, which is the original language of scripture. This word is paraclete, paraclete. Para means something that comes alongside of, like you have two train tracks that are parallel. You have a paragraph, sentences alongside one another. So para is something that's alongside. Cleat, the last part of the word, comes from a Greek word that means called. So the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one called alongside, the one that is there to help. Now, the ancient world world understood this word paraclete very clearly. It was a legal term. Um, And it means called to the side of for the purpose of helping. So if you are called to court, a paraclete would come to your side. Leon Morris has an outstanding commentary called The Gospel According to John. And he comments on this word paraclete on page 665. And he says, any friend who would take action to give help in a time of legal need might be called a paraclete or an advocate. In other words, here's a person that's on trial. Here's a person that is facing some court sentence. In those days, the food in the prisons was lousy. I mean, it it just was almost unedible. So your paraclete could come and supply your need of bringing that food, bringing you food into your prison cell. Also, it would be, could be very cold or damp in those prison cells. So your paraclete, the one that the, came alongside to help you, court-appointed helper, they could bring you mittens or they could bring you socks. They would also stand as your defense attorney. So to think of a paraclete or this helper, the word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, think of somebody who will supply all your needs. How does Jesus know our needs? Because he tabernacled in human flesh. He was hungry. He was tired. He was without a home. He was rejected, despised. He suffered hunger. He suffered physical, mental, and emotional pain. There at the cross, all the disciples forsook him and fled. Uh, There at the cross, when the nails went through his hands, he experienced more pain than any of us could ever go through. There in the wilderness, when he chose not to eat for those 40 days, he had physical cravings greater than any physical craving we could ever imagine, greater than the craving of a person trying to give up tobacco or alcohol or or illicit drugs. When Jesus went through that, that starvation period, really, it's what it was, he was starving for food. When he went through that period in the wilderness of, of hunger and the intense hunger pains, those physical pains were greater than any physical craving. So Jesus himself experienced the full gamut of human pain, the full gamut of emotional trauma. And so when you and I get on our knees and pray now, because Christ understands what we're going through, because Christ has walked this way before us, because his footsteps have trod our path, he sends the Holy Spirit to come along our side as the helper, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to lift the burden of discouragement off our shoulder, to bring comfort and peace and joy to our hearts. So if you are feeling lonely tonight, if the mountain is high, if the road is rough, if the thorns on the road of life have been bruising your feet, the good news is Jesus understands it. And as you get on your knees to pray, he will send the comforter, the divine paraclete to come by your side to give you hope, to give you encouragement, to give you strength to go on in the trauma of life when we're lying there on the hospital bed in the trauma of life when a loved one is injured in a car accident, in the trauma of life when the fires are raging all around us, when there is hurricane and cyclone and tornado, in the trauma of life when there's war, when there's famine and sickness and suffering and disease, Jesus comes 
through the Holy Spirit. He leaps into our lives to give us strength and new courage. And he says, my brother, my sister, you can make it. You can make it. I'm with you. I will never leave you, never forsake you. His Holy Spirit is there. I've seen the Holy Spirit work so powerfully. We were holding meetings in Los Angeles, California. There were two sessions each evening, an early session and a later session. Between the two sessions, we'd usually get a little soup or something to eat to give us enough strength to preach the second time. And I was sitting there with my staff and somebody said, Pastor Mark, our sound technician kind of fainted and, and he never came to supper. He, he's fallen over in the midst of the uh, chairs in the auditorium. We rushed back in, tried to revive him, called 911. They revived him temporarily, but one day later he died in the hospital of, of a heart attack, had a blood clot and died of that heart attack. Where is God in trauma like that? I will never forget the courage that his wife had. Certainly a sword pierced her heart. Certainly there was great sorrow. But to see the Holy Spirit come as the comforter. You know, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And to see the Holy Spirit comfort that, that dear Christian lady and give her strength to go on with life. After the death of her husband, she could continue to go on. Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he'll give you another what? Comforter that he may abide with you forever. Look at that word comforter. It comes from two Latin words, come meaning with and fortis meaning strength. So the Holy Spirit is the paraclete that comes along our side he is the great comforter that strengthens us in the challenges and trials of life. The Holy Spirit is the one that is, is ever near when we need him most. He is the one that provides help for our daily needs. He is the one that's there with us morning, midday, and evening to supply that help. Christ's Object Lessons, page 96, book on the parables of Jesus says this, none are so vile, none have fallen so low as to be, yet to be beyond the working of this Holy Spirit's power. In all who would submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be implanted. The lost image of God is to be restored in humanity. Not only is the Holy Spirit our guide, not only is he our, the, our comforter, but he is the one that takes our lives and makes us over again. What did the statement say? None are so vile. None have fallen so low. But the Holy Spirit can take them and change them and lift them up. He takes us from the guttermost to the uttermost. From the depths of despair in our lives to, do, to the delights of discipleship, of walking with Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, an entire change can be made in your life. An entire change can be made in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit also is our personal teacher. Jesus said in John 14, verse 17, When he, the Spirit, is come, he will teach you all things. And he talks about the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. What does it mean that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth? It means a number of things. First, the devil tells you lies about yourself. The devil lies to you. The devil says, you're not good enough. The devil says, you can never make heaven. The devil says, why don't you give up now? The devil says, you are worthless. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth, that you're created in the image of God. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth, that Christ is, died for you and that because of the sacrifice of Christ you can live in heaven forever the Holy Spirit reveals to you that he will be by your side helping you to make it through the trials and challenges of life the Holy Spirit is our teacher in addition to that the Holy Spirit reveals to us the truth of God's word when we are seeking for truth when we are truth seekers and we say, I'm not satisfied with what I have. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not satisfied with the church that I've been going to. Maybe you're, you've not attended any church and you're thinking, I'm not satisfied with what I have. It's the Holy Spirit. As you get on your knees, say, God, reveal to me truth. 
John 16, verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come. See, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's going to be revealing to you truth in God's word. He'll guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he'll tell you things to come. And so you come to Christ and you say, Jesus, guide me into all truth. Lord, I'm seeking for truth. Lord, I've gone down this pathway and it hasn't worked. And I've gone down that pathway and it hasn't worked. And Lord, I'm kind of confused, but seek me. Lord, all I want to know is your truth. And God, through his Holy Spirit, will lead you into truth as we study the word. The same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible will inspire you. The Holy Spirit that inspired the word will inspire you. The Holy Spirit that inspired every one of these Bible writers is going to inspire you. Steps to Christ, page 114. We can attain to an understanding of God's word only through the illumination of that spirit by which the word was given. If we try to study the Bible without seeking the Holy Spirit, we are going to become confused. But God says to us, the same Holy Spirit who revealed truth to the Bible prophets as they wrote the Bible reveals truth to us as we study scripture. Notice Psalm 119 verse 107, I'm afflicted very much, revive me according to your word. Psalm 119, 154, please my cause and redeem me, revive me according to what? Your word. The Holy Spirit revives us. I love that prayer. Oh Lord, whatever truth you have for me, I desire it. Whatever changes you want for my life, I want them. O oh, divine heavenly dove, come and instruct me. Is this your prayer? Would you like to say today, Jesus, I need your spirit. I sense that, that your spirit is not some force. I sense that your spirit is not some power merely, but it's the third person of the Godhead. And I, I long to have an intimate relationship with Christ. I long to have the power of Christ living in my heart. I long to have the peace, the fulfillment, the meaning, the purpose that only Christ can bring. Jesus, come by your spirit and walk at my side through life. Stand by me, Lord, because I can't go through life without you. Lord, may the paraclete come, the one who walks by at my side. Empower me, God, by your spirit, because I desperately need your spirit. Oh, divine dove, come and live in my life. Is that your prayer? Why not bow your head with me just now as we pray? Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we are not orphans. We are so incredibly thankful that you have not left us alone in this world. We're thankful for Jesus who has sent his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, to change our lives, to bring us joy and peace and power. We're thankful for the one that walks by our side momentarily, guiding and directing us through the journey of life. When the day is long, the night is dark, Thank you for the illuminating light of the Spirit that gives us hope and encouragement. And thank you for the promise of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.